part of the Adult Summer Reading Program. So please, as you as you enjoy today's performance, and we hope that you do, be sure and give us your feedback on our comment cards, and let us know exactly what you think of this program, as well as the other things that we have here to offer at the Simi Valley Public Library. And if you are a particular fan of the arts, as I know you are, make sure you pick up our calendars, because we're having concerts and all kinds of artistic and musical programming throughout the summer to support a summer reading program faces to talk a bit to you about me. However, <laughs> I did not come here to tell you about my, primarily, to tell you about my storied career or my manifold compositions, which indeed my compositions are manifold and famous, and my career is definitely storied. But primarily I came to you today to discuss with you a dilemma. I wrote about it extensively, and specifically in one article that was published in many newspapers, which discusses the dangers and the dread consequences of mechanized music. <laughs> in fact, my article is entitled, The Menace of Mechanized Music. For, you see, ladies and gentlemen, as I'm sure you will agree, music is a relationship between a performer who has studied and is now sharing their music and a receiver, an audience member, who is hearing that music and experiencing that music right then and there. But did you know, this may come as a shock to you, there are now, right now, they are developing music by which to take a performance by musicians and record it into a device so that then that the sound of that performance could then be taken and played from a device at a later time potentially thousands of miles away from the performers themselves. <laughs> Unbelievable and dangerous, frankly. <laughs> because please try with me to imagine a world, a culture in which all that a young person has to do to hear a piece of music is to flip a mechanical switch and there they have their favorite tune playing from musicians coming out of nowhere. That is not what music is meant to be. And if a young person has access to that, why then, I ask you, should they go through the rigors of learning a musical instrument as I and millions of others did as a child? Now, granted, I did have certain advantages myself as a child learning music. At the age of six, it was discovered that I have what is called absolute pitch, or AP. Many of you may know it as perfect pitch. It means that I can detect the letter pitch of a sound that I hear uh, with 100% accuracy. It's different from relevant relative pitch, which many people have, which means that if you hear two notes, you can tell how far away they are from each other, uh, fifth or a fourth, etc. But this is, in fact, I can hear a note and know what it is just from hearing that note. I can also detect the notes in a chord and tell you that not only the distance of each note, but each note, what it actually is, the letter value of that note. 
I can do the same with clusters, meaning notes that are close together, harder to discern. I can also, as we people with AP can do, I can also play, reproduce either vocally or on an instrument, a piece of music that I heard a week ago in the same key that I heard it play. These are all things that a person with absolute pitch can do and people with no, without absolute pitch cannot. But my favorite part about absolute pitch, of course, is that I can discern for you the notes of mechanical devices, like a train whistle, or my favorite, one of those new-fangled automobiles, their horns, I can tell you the, the pitches of a horn. But if I had not had access to those skills, I still would have wanted to pursue a career in music. And even if I did not pursue a career in music and make it my rich, rich livelihood, I would have still wanted to perform music as an amateur, because it is a rich part of life. It's not something that is meant to be done and then never seen again and heard by others who would never be. And it bothers me to think of that. In fact, it bothers me so much, ladies and gentlemen, that soon after I wrote that article, I really, uh, I started needing to shoot things. In order to feel that. <laughs> I'm serious, actually. Uh, you probably don't know this about me, but around 1906, when I wrote that article, I got very interested in trap shooting. And by 10 years later, one decade later, 1916, I founded and was the first president of the International Trap Shooting Association. Did anyone here know that about me? Isn't that amazing? I have all these other things other than the music that you know me for. It's true. So I, I did do that as well to calm down. But my personal coping mechanisms aside, mechanical music is a danger. Now, I, I'm sure that you can tell, young people need to be guided along the way. I'm sure that you can tell by looking at me. Just one moment looking at me, I'm sure you can see that I was a wild child. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I was, it's true. At 13, I decided that I would go ahead and run away and join the circus. It's true, I wanted to be uh, the violinist in this circus band. But I'm also a man of order, and I'm a patriot. I believe in authority, and that is why I decided that it was my duty to inform my father, John Sousa Sr., and my mother, Maria, that I was going to secretly run away. <laughs> Surprisingly, they did not approve, and they sent me away to join the military, to join specifically the Marines as an apprentice in the Marine Corps Bank which I ended up enjoying immensely and found my way to first chair very quickly, replacing young people much older than me. After that, I did uh, have a wonderful career professionally as a first violinist in many Broadway pit orchestras and touring companies. And then I found my way back again to the military where I found a true home for decades, this time not as an apprentice, but as the official conductor of the Marine Corps Band. It was in this period that I wrote, there it is, I like that flag, I love those colors, they do not run. Where I found uh, true happiness and was able to create many, many, many marches. In fact, over the course of my career, uh, 70 songs, 15 operettas, and 136 marches. Most of them famous and well known, for which I received the moniker March King which sounds good to me. I, I like it indeed. Now, I do want to tell you that while I was in the military, I had a wonderful time serving, because I am a patriot, it matters not to me who is in the presidency. I served uh, as, a, as a conductor for the band at performances for five different presidents. Most interestingly to me was when I performed, and this is very rare that a president should be elected as a single man, but Grover Cleveland was. Grover Cleveland was a single man when elected, and he got married while in office. We, the Marine Band, had the honor of being the musicians at the wedding ceremony in the White House. And we wanted to do such a good job that myself and a general, the night before the wonderful wedding, we timed the music such that the bride's approach would last precisely long enough so that when she approached the dais and went up the stairs, the music would come to its crescendo, which is a very difficult thing I'm sure you can imagine doing, especially considering a nervous, blushing bride. But we did it, because these are the things that you do for love. 
Are they not? Now, I want to return for a moment to the subject of recorded music. I want you to know that I am not and never have been a hypocrite. However, I have been called a hypocrite because those very things that I am railing against to you, I and my music have been among the first purveyors. That is recorded music. My marches are among the first things to have been recorded. But there's a very good reason for that, and it is physical, as in physics. The microphone used for these recordings is what's called a dynamic microphone, which means that it receives vibration and thus turns on. When there is not vibration, it literally turns off. So you can imagine the softest sections of a Mozart concerto would not necessarily even turn the microphone on, and you would lose large chunks of music. Now, a more robust sound, for example, say, what kind of music? A march. A march, exactly. A march is always going to register on the dynamic microphone and therefore was a very sensible fit for these recordings. But I must say, I kept my hands clean. Not once have I ever conducted even my own marches for recordings. But other people do that. I do not want to be a direct part of it. The other problem, of course, with recording, which is perhaps the most severe, is how do we as artists maintain a career as artists if the profit possibility is in someone else's hands? I can't imagine a world where a musician would be treated fairly in that way. The musician performs the music and gets paid for that performance right then and there. If you divorce that performance, from the performance's viewership or listenership, if you take them and separate them, how can you be sure that the performer will get paid when the listening is happening at another time and place? Other than, of course, the goodwill of the owner. Why should we trust the owner's goodwill to make sure that the performer gets paid? So it is a very dangerous and precarious position. I myself, I must say to you, Yes, I'm sure you know I am a very successful man and very wealthy, but I assure you, good people, my wealth did not and has not and never will come from recording. I made all of my fortune on live performances. My band, the famous John Philip Sousa Band, being the most recognizable band of all time up to the time, up to that point in history, performing in hundreds of performances in dozens of countries, I made, I amassed quite a fortune from live performances, producing the music right then and there for you to hear and being paid for that event. Would you care to guess how much I made for selling the rights to my most famous march? Meaning to record the money I made off of recording, anyone care to guess how much I made from selling the rights to my most famous march? Yes, in the back, you have a number? No, you have a problem with your hair. <laughs> yes, sir. The young sir. Always the brave ones are the young ones. $87 was very specific and also not very far off the mark. It was 35 Let's give this young man. And definitely do not give a hand to the industry that makes it thus that I should work and give my work out for $35. The other thing that we need to recognize, of course, is that it just doesn't sound the same coming from a little box as it sounds live in front of you. And here to prove that I have a volunteer, I believe, who has brought a device for which you to hear recorded music. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you recorded music. <laughs>
and I present proudly to you Dan Crocker and his band. Yep. That is music, ladies and gentlemen. In 1889, a small, upstart, insignificant newspaper asked me to compose a piece, a march, for their event. This event was an essay contest award ceremony for a children's essay contest. So it was a, seemed a small event for an insignificant paper. Why, why would I do such a thing? Well, the paper was in Washington, D.C., which is my birthplace and my hometown. I was born there in 1854 on November the 6th. And so I felt the heartstrings of the hometown, so I did make this march for them. And then it turned out that this was an incredibly well-attended event right up to President Harrison. Can you believe it? Well, it's probably because me and my band were there, to be perfectly clear. <laughs> but it was an incredibly well-attended event, and word spread of this march until it spread all over the world. And this is actually one of the most famous marches there is, as it turns out. And the march bears the name of that newspaper. Does anyone want to guess what that name of that march and newspaper is? Washington Post. Washington Post. Post. Nice. That's what they just performed for you. Now, I bet that now that you've heard the difference between mechanized music and live music, you'd like to hear some more live music, Yay! am I correct? Yay! I would too. I would too. Uh, my esteemed colleague is going to tell us what he has in store to play for us next. We have the official march of the United States Marine Corps, Summer Vanilla. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, for this particular piece, I need a moment. <laughs> they say that the greatest inspiration comes when we are emotionally and personally tied. Oh, my glasses. When we are emotionally and personally tied to the art that we create. And such is true for the March Semper Fidelis. As you know, much of my life, one night literally in tears after hearing the Marine Band singing one of their famous anthems at Quantico. And so I wrote it, I believe, to be my most perfect march in terms of its structure and in terms of its emotional connection. And so I proudly present to you what indeed, as my esteemed colleague pointed out, became the official Peace, the official march for the Marines. And it is called Semper Fidelis, which means what? Always faithful. Always faithful. Ladies and gentlemen, with pride, Semper Fidelis.
tend not to be able to hear that tune without a little bit of a breakdown. <laughs> oh, do you like it? Yes. I'm so glad. I'm so glad. Thank you. Thank you so much. Now, uh, ladies and gentlemen, one of the things that is unique about the marching band sound is its rich, deep tones. So I want to show you now one of the things that makes the marching band sound possible and so robust and so popular. If I can get my uh, wonderful colleague here, uh, can you tell us your name? Alec. This is Alec, ladies and gentlemen. Give Alec a hand. <laughs> so this, this instrument that Alec wears, does anyone know the name of this instrument? Sousaphone. That's right, it is a sousaphone. And what gentleman are you talking with right now? <laughs> Mr. Phone, Mr. Phone. This is not a Mr. Phone, that's right. <laughs> Talk to the phone. No, I, this is not an accident. This, this instrument was, many people believe that I invented it. That is a piece of modern, whatever you call it. It's not true. The truth is that I did have it commissioned, however. I had it commissioned because there was a problem with the instruments when I first started conducting, and that was that the bell of the instrument pushed the sound in the wrong direction. And I wanted the sound to lift above the band and float down onto the audience. So I had the bell, I asked for a piece of, uh, for an instrument that would move the bell upwards, straight up. And of course, as you can imagine, on a rainy day, <laughs> this presented a problem and the instrument in that orientation started to get the moniker of rain catcher. <laughs> so then I, I had a commission that it would force the sound outward. And because it is high above an already tall gentleman's head, <laughs> the sound now goes, floats above the band and straight to the audience in its beautiful, robust, deep tones, dulcet, deep tones. I would ask you to please play a dulcet, deep tone now for us. Woo, do you feel that in your bones? Very nice, very nice. As you can see, it is formed thus, such that the player can carry it easily as well. And I care about the comfort of my band members. I would never ask someone to bear a, an instrument that I would not bear myself. This was not my primary instrument. I never bore it in performance. However, I am happy to show you now what it is like to take on and off. It is a very simple process. If you could go ahead and lift that off. This is how we lift it off, right over the shoulder. And then when you take your hat, when you throw Oh, yes, that would be like force. There are. Much. Now you grab it here first. And then you take your other hand and you place it on the bell thusly. Place it there. <laughs> Just testing you, Alan. And then you lift it very simply over your shoulder. And, and as you can see, it's very easy to bear the weight of this instrument. It's not a burden at all. You, you want to tone it. You tune it by, by hitting it with your forehead as I just did. <laughs> That's how you know that it is in good working condition. And so as you can see, I'm happy to bear any instrument that I ask anyone else to. This is me bearing a me phone. Yeah. Thank you very much. I will give this very light and easy burden back to Alec. Now, and, uh, here, there we go. There. Perfect, thank you. Excellent, Alec. <laughs> shoulder massage now, and I am going to give the focus of attention to the wonderful band leader, Mr. Crocker, who's going to break down one of my most famous marches. Let's hear it from Mr. Crocker.
yet still there is another melody going on at the exact same time in the trombone that it sounds like this. And if you can hear all of them together now, you'll hear all four parts playing the exact same time. Right, one, two, ready, and... And that was the genius of uh, Mr. Souza. He was able to mix all these things that would be very uncomfortable to mix together, he mixed them together seamlessly so you don't even hear that it happens. Oh, stop, right. really? No, stop, <laughs> stop, stop, stop. There's no more. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we are going to leave you now. We've had a wonderful time with you. We really, really deeply appreciate you coming here. I personally must say that it's an honor. And I want to leave you with this thought. Your young people, and you yourselves who are young people, can truly deeply benefit from learning and playing an instrument, whether it is what you plan to do as a career or not. It is a wonderful thing to do, and it is a wonderful way to keep the tradition of live musical performance alive. Now, I don't know if you did, but I certainly, as an expert, noticed several wrong notes. <laughs> That's part of the beauty of it. Live music is different in some consequential or inconsequential way every single time it is performed. And that is what makes your experience special. When you turn on your IP or whatever that strange bladder control <laughs> device is called <laughs> that plays any music that you want whenever you want it, it is exactly the same as someone else hearing it across the country and across the world and it will never change and never alter. It is an impersonal experience. What you had today, ladies and gentlemen, with the help Dan Proctor and his band is a personal experience, and I hope that you will encourage that in others. And if you are interested in knowing more about me, there is a wonderful building very close by <laughs> where you can learn a great deal about me and my career. So I would like to leave you, if it is all right, I would like to ask the indulgence of the band, if I may conduct you in Stars and Struggles. Yeah. <laughs> and I would like, thank you so much, and I would like to ask your indulgement, indulgence, may I conduct for you one of my favorite and most famous right. marches, Stars and Stripes Forever. Yeah. 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 And I leave you with this, Stars and Stripes Forever. Thank you very much for coming.